In December, Bangladesh went to the polls, with Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina securing a landslide victory. She said she won on the back of Bangladesh's impressive economic record and a decade of growth. Her opponent says she stole the election. We are rejecting the results. While international monitors accuse her of silencing her critics and muzzling the press. The gagging of the media, the extrajudicial killings, the disappearances. So, is Bangladesh becoming a one-party state? And whilst hosting over one million Rohingya refugees fleeing Myanmar, how long can and will Bangladesh protect them? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head-to-head -head with Gauhar Rizvi, the international affairs advisor to Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and a historian and former academic. I'll challenge him on whether democracy is dying in Bangladesh and whether his country should be doing more to help Rohingya refugees. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Tasneem Khalil, a Swedish-Bangladeshi journalist and author of Jallad, Death Squads and State Terror in South Asia. Saida Muna Tasneem, Bangladesh's High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. And Abbas Faiz, a South Asia analyst at the UK's Essex University, who previously worked for Amnesty International for more than 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gauhar Rizvi. <laughs> Gauhar Rizvi has held senior positions in universities around the world, including Oxford, Harvard and the University of Virginia. He's worked for the Prime Minister for a decade and his role is the equivalent to that of a cabinet minister. Uh, Gauhar Rizvi, following your party, the Awami League's recent landslide election victory in December, it does look more and more like Bangladesh is becoming a one-party state, does it not? I'm surprised that you would say that. This has been said earlier by a number of people. So it's not that surprising? Uh, uh, no, but I'm surprised that you said it. Okay. Because as one who has studied politics, you will understand that just because a party has been elected three times, it is not a one-party state. The reason it, you're being called a one-party state is not just because you win lots of elections. As you say, many parties do that. It's the margin by which you win. Just to be clear, of the 300 seats contested in the December election, how many seats did your ruling coalition win in Parliament? 288. 288 out of 300? Yes. How many did the opposition win? Well, let's... Seven. Me, no, let me put this question to 288 you. 288 to seven. This, no, let me put this question to you differently. Give me one good reason why the opposition should have been voted into power. They did not have a manifesto. They were ambivalent whether they will go into an election or not. So you're comfortable with a 96% no. of the seats. That's it, what you want. Yes. Sheikh Hasina is now winning the kind of percentage victories that Bashar al-Assad and Kim Jong-un win. 96%. Right. That, no, that's you're comfortable with no, that no, in a no, democracy. No, this, you're this, fine with that. No. You, I think the comparison is totally irrelevant. Here, there were the 39 political parties contested in the election. Free and fair elections took place. Large number of uh, international observers were there who saw it for themselves. Who would not vote for a government which has performed so brilliantly by any count? And if you want me, if you there give me... There are many nine, brilliant I, governments I, and they win 50, 60, 70 percent. OK, you say it's a free and fair election. Let's yes. deal with that point. As you know, the European Union has said there were, quote, significant obstacles which have tainted the electoral campaign and the vote. Transparency International studied 50 constituencies in Bangladesh and found serious irregularities in 47 of them, and what was including it? fake votes, ballot stuffing, voters barred from entering polling stations. The BBC have footage of a stuffed ballot box in the port city of Chittagong. The Are the BBC and Transparency International just making this all up? One of my closest friends is the head of uh, Bangladesh Transparency International. Okay. So I'm not going to impute any, so uh, then deal with the report, no, 47 no, out of 50. I would like, no, the election commission found irregularities in 15 or 19, I forget the exact number of polling stations. And when, there, when you remember, there were 40,000 plus polling stations. So 
If but, 15, but here's what I don't get. 15, if 15 or 19. It's not that it's 15 or 19, it's that your friend's organization looked at 50 seats and 47 but of them I, I, turned I, out to have irregularities. I am yet that's to see something, the, I can't I'm do the maths to, off the top of I'm, my head, but I'm that's like 95%. It's like your no. margin of victory. No. Isn't happened. the problem that Human Rights Watch describes how opposition members have been arrested, killed, and even disappeared in the months running up to the election? There was a quote, atmosphere of fear. 150 opposition members were arrested just two weeks before the election. Surely that cripples your election campaign if the government keeps arresting your members. These were people who committed arson and killing in, in the months of January to March 2015. After that, they went underground. They hid. At the time of the election, they resurfaced. There were allegations, criminal charges against them. And so when they yeah. resurfaced, they were uh, arrested. Well, I just want to deal with some of the people you put criminal charges against in the opposition. You said that a man called Mintu Kumar Das, a Dhaka BNP leader, was charged with blocking a road in September 2018. The problem is he died in 2007. <laughs> Isn't this embarrassing no, for your government? Of course it is embarrassing. You're throwing criminal charges uh, at opposition course, members who are dead. You know, when such, uh, such charges are made, it is uh, 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 embarrassing, but one knows that in police investigation, in many societies, especially in developing countries, often uh, have these uh, short, uh, shortcomings. It's not just the opposition that have been on the brunt of your government. Uh, the media uh, have had some issues, I think it's fair to say. Let me quote you. You said, civilization cannot flourish without freedom of expression. Indeed. Censorship never works, which is a good line, but in practice, there have been numerous examples of media crackdowns. Perhaps the most famous case is out of the photojournalist uh, Shahid Al-Alam, who was dragged from his house by police after documenting a student protest in August and then criticizing your government on this channel, actually, on Al Jazeera English. Sheikh Hasina, your prime minister, described Mr. Alam as, quote, mentally sick. Do you think he's mentally sick or is he just a journalist trying to do his job? Those who are familiar with the media in Bangladesh will know one thing. It is free, it is vigorous. Shahid al-Alam was not arrested for appearing on Al Jazeera and, and making a, a comment. He was arrested for spreading disinformation which was inciting violence. Shahid is my very close friend. Shahid Al-Alam told reporters outside court in August that he was beaten so badly by police that his tunic needed washing because of all the blood. He was jailed for 107 days and said he was tortured. Is that how you treat your friends? I... <laughs> Listen, I have not said a word about his treatment. All I have said is, Shahid is a close friend of mine, and when he was arrested, I took it on myself to make sure that he was given proper medical treatment his family was able to carry food for him. OK. And Why do he you was... need medical treatment? Well, uh, uh, not because of the beating that you said. You're denying that he was beaten by the police? I did not deny that. Because I cannot deny it because I do not know what happened. Okay. All I am going Is your to friend say... mentally sick? No. Why did the prime minister say he's mentally sick? I have no idea about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she was, had in her mind. But if somebody spreads disinformation, which endangers life, which incites violence. What was violence. that disinformation, just before we move on? We're that uh, there were uh, several people killed and whose d uh, dead bodies were hidden in Awami League office in, in Dhanmandi. Women were raped. And... No, no, just wait, don't, don't okay. say no. Hold on. Even if it was false, you think it's worth locking him up? I stand by my court and I will go to my death saying the same thing, that without freedom of expression, our civilization will collapse. So, on the other hand, the government has responsibility to protect citizens. Agreed. Let's bring in our panel, uh, who are waiting patiently to come in here. I'm joined by Tasneem Khalil, a Swedish Bangladeshi journalist, author of Jallad, Death Squads and State Terror uh, in South Asia. Um, Tasneem, do you think it's fair to say that Sheikh Hasina is turning Bangladesh into a one-party state, into an authoritarian state, as many journalists are claiming, especially in the West? Uh, yes, Nadi, Sheikh Hasina has not only turned uh, the country into a one-party state, and she has very successfully done that. Uh, she has uh, very capable advisors like Dr. Rizvi, who would come on international television and very eloquently, uh, you know, uh, try to defend her. But the truth remains that Bangladesh is a country where uh, people are picked up from their homes, they're abducted, they're kept in secret detention, there is a uh, program of enforced disappearances. Uh, people are extrajudicially executed. 
people are imprisoned in thousands. Uh, I mean, we saw during the recent elections. And even the, anyone who the regime thinks that is a problem, uh, they go after him or her with absolute viciousness. And just on his point about free and fair media, everyone in this hall would agree it's a free, fair, vigorous media. You're a journalist, you no longer live in Bangladesh. What's your view? Well, Bangladesh is a country where journalists are beaten mercilessly by uh, the goons of Bangladesh Shatrali, the student wing of uh, Bangladesh Army League. We have video footage, of course, uh, Dr. Rijvi would say, well, one or two journalists getting beaten up. That's, that's nothing to uh, care about, maybe. Uh, but it's a, it's a very, okay. very uh, dark situation. OK, before I bring back in uh, Gahar Rizvi, I'm going to go to Saida Muna Tasneem, who's Bangladesh's High Commissioner uh, to the UK and Ireland. When you hear uh, Tasneem speaking there, uh, it's, a, it's a litany, but thousands behind bars, extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, must make your job quite hard defending the Bangladeshi government here in the West, here in the UK. But Tasneem doesn't even live in Bangladesh, so you know, he's, he's seeing Bangladesh from outside, just like you're doing. Why doesn't he live in Bangladesh? I have no idea. Okay, well, come so on. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is that... <laughs> Um, Bangladesh definitely, you know, in the history of Bangladesh and press freedom, if you look at the 70s, 80s, 90s and 2000s, even until 2000, there was just one private TV channel. Right now, Sheikh Hasina, in two, between 2009 and 2018, has opened up the media and 32 private TV channels every day, 90 political talk shows, Sheikh Hasina has been criticized left and right. There are newspapers criticizing Sheikh Hasina and the parliament she's been criticized. So why wouldn't Bangladesh have press freedom? She doesn't need to put anybody's voice down. In there are also of, people being arrested for criticizing her too. A woman, it's who, just, it, the a woman few, for uh, the, the doing numbers, a post on that, Facebook that's, that's was a arrested fraction, about That's Sheikh a fraction. Hasina. That's a small fraction. That doesn't mean that Bangladesh doesn't have press freedom. Before I bring in Abbas Faiz, Tasneem, very quickly, why don't you live in Bangladesh anymore? As a journalist, I cannot operate independently in the country. Uh, I would be abducted, I would be tortured, like Shahid al Alam, my colleague. And, and when friend was with. that? Which period did he leave the country before Sheikh Hasina came into office? But he's given many examples as well. Let me bring in uh, Abbas Faiz, a South Asia analyst at the UK's Essex University, previously worked for Amnesty International for more than 30 years. Uh, Abbas, Tasneem mentioned enforced disappearances as well, something I'm going to bring Gahar Rizvi back on as well. Can you shed some light on what is going on in Bangladesh with these claims being made about people disappearing? Well, what is happening in Bangladesh under the current government's watch is really very unacceptable. In terms of democracy, all the independent institutions of the state have been weakened. The parliament has become an extension of the government. And all of these things have happened by the support of people, intellectuals like Mr. Gohar Rezvi, who are actually falsifying the, nat the nature of the uh, issues. Now, to just go back to, yeah. um, to the uh, enforced disappearances, the way it happens that a group of plainclothes officers go to the house of the people, they collect them, they take them away, and then uh, the police, the security agencies, and all of those people, they just say that they don't have any knowledge of them. Do you want to respond well, to okay. Abbas? I think if you are saying a boss, that this is the government policy, I fear you are mistaken. Government does not need to disappear uh, people. Government have authority to arrest people if they feel somebody has done things wrong. But you wrong. have the responsibility and, to and, protect and them. And to remind them. Okay. Are you denying that people like Mir Ahmed bin Qasim, Hassan Ali, Shafiq al-Islam, Modu, who were in front of their families in many cases were taken by plainclothes police officers on CCTV Listen, in one case, I am, were they not taken? I am going to say again. Are you denying again, that? No. I'm you saying, asked me for it evidence. It is most deplorable if this is true, or if this were to happen. But other names were also given. The same set of people have resurfaced and are openly moving around in the society. But not all of them. If the British past. government and the US government and Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and Bangladeshi human rights groups are all saying are you, that people are being disappeared, shouldn't we, you investigate we, that? Of course we will investigate. Independently. OK. Huh? I want to ask you about the War Crimes Tribunal set up in 2010 by the Bangladeshi government to bring justice for the atrocities that were committed during the War of Independence in 1971. First, these tribunals were welcomed by the international community. However, in recent years, the UN, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the International Center for Transitional justice, they've all raised serious concerns about the fairness of these trials, in particular the use of the death penalty. You claim to be part of a progressive party, but you're overseeing tribunals that the International Commission of Jurists says do not adhere to international standards of a fair trial and due process. Let me first ask you, 
is Why there... is it every time I ask you a question, you want no, to ask I want to ask you, because... <laughs> That's not because, how this works. No, because, because you have raised the question of international practice, yeah. international standards. Do you not like international standards? No, 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 no. I am going to ask you, is there an in, uh, international gold standard? No, there isn't. What exists is in every country. The countries have set up their own courts. And where you compare the court is with the normal high court and the appellate division. Was the process followed in the tribunal in any way inferior to our high court and our Supreme Court? No. Bangladesh was the only country which tried uh, war criminals and gave them full right of representation. Full evidence was placed into the hands of their uh, defense lawyers. They were allowed to bring in as many uh, defense That's lawyers not... as witnesses? necessary as witnesses. What about witnesses who were abducted from outside the court prior to testifying? Now, I don't know about that uh, particular thing. You, I mean, uh, the International Commission of Jurists says defense witnesses have been abducted and no. intimidated, and there are credible allegations of collusion between the government, prosecutors, and judges. Isn't it the case that Sheikh Hasina just wants to get guilty verdicts no. No. and therefore cut corners? First you, first, you tell me it is not of international standards. When I tell you that the standards followed in Bangladesh courts were higher than what that happened in Nuremberg trial, is as good as... I any... don't remember anyone accusing the Nuremberg trials of abducting witnesses outside the court. Probably. No other international tribunal gave an opportunity for appeal. Not only appeal, it also gave Bangladesh uh, rules, gave an opportunity for judicial review. If after all these things you say... I'm not that, saying. Uh, that these I'm saying were international not jurists are saying it, who know their stuff. Okay, let's move on. There was a lot of opposition between quote-unquote secularists and Islamists in Bangladesh. In just three years, between 2013 and 2016, as you know, there were 10 brutal murders of atheist bloggers as well as other activists. Mm -hmm. Is there zero tolerance for extremists who kill bloggers from your government? Indeed, yes. Then why did the... After the death of one blogger, Avijit Roy, in February 2015, why did Sheikh Hasina's son, an advisor to the government, he said your government, quote, can't come out strongly for him as they don't want to be seen as atheists. Another minister, Sharia Alam, said that whilst these attacks are not acceptable, at the same time we expect people to stop criticizing the Prophet. From a supposedly <clears throat> secular government, that's a pretty intolerant, some would say cowardly approach to the murder of your own uh, citizens. I'm not going to defend the statements made by others. You can ask them. But they're your but, colleagues. But what I am going You're to... You're not here to no, be no, solo. Go home is you. here no, representing the I government am of going to say to, What I am going to say to you is government does take very strong action against all crimes, including crimes against uh, bloggers. But what is often not recognized is that there is also another law in the country which says that uh, you can be punished for uh, insulting religious beliefs or hurting religious sentiment. Is that your version of a blasphemy law? Th that is what a blasphemy law is. So how can you say you're a secular government, secular country? Of course we are secular. You're locking up bloggers for offending religious sentiments. How is that secular? I don't know as yet of which blogger has been uh, arrested for... Russell Pervez, no. blogger who fled to Japan after being arrested. Was he arrested for... Uh, uh, for insulting uh, religious sentiments, yes. No. If, you are, if, you are going to, uh, if you are going to incite violence by insulting... No, 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 no. In, come on. There's no the insight. No, no. I'm I asking you, minister, are you I, a secular country if you lock up bloggers for offending Islam, yes or no? I do have to, as a member of the government, okay. say that if public safety is endangered, governments have a responsibility. That's an that's a excuse that many governments use. You say that you're a secular party and secular government. You say your opponents, the BNP, the Bangladesh National Party, are theocratic. You say they're in bed with Jamaat-e Islami, quote unquote, Islamists. But some would say that you've gotten into bed with some pretty extreme groups too, the Hifazat-e Islam movement. Uh, you've given in to some of their pretty extreme demands. You even refused your party to condemn them when they recently uh, attacked the education of teenage girls in Bangladesh. Why? Now, if, uh, maybe uh, compare like with like. Jamaat is a political party. Hifadi Islam is not a political party. Irrelevant to my question. No, it is relevant. No, I was asking it about is, secularism. It, it is, it is, How are you a secular am, party I am if you ally? To I am within... coming to that. Okay. It is a student's uh, movement. So is the Taliban. Uh, it's a student's movement. There are 1.4 million students studying in 
uh, in madrasas controlled yeah. by the Hifazat yeah. group. The government is trying to bring them out to modernize their curriculum, to make them employable, okay. to train them Fair in enough. modern sciences and education so that they become employable and keep away from radicalism. No one's saying you shouldn't talk to them. And that's it's what It's about we've done. giving in to their demands. You say that you're modernizing their curriculum. They seem to be having more impact on your curriculum. They asked for 17 stories and poems to be removed from school textbooks. You agreed. They asked to move a female statue representing justice from the Supreme Court. You agreed. They condemned the education of teenage girls. Your minister said that's fine. It's free speech. You're just appeasing them while telling the world you're secular. Oh, does it not uh, bear to reflect on the fact that there are more women today in secondary and primary schools than there are men. Is that a restriction? So do we you have... condemn this course, group of for saying I do. You condemn of them course, for saying that course, teenage girls shouldn't... Our policy is condemning them. No, that's and not, by, that's by not true. By Your deputy minister for education refused to condemn them. He said whoever's made the comment, it is I am condemning opinion. you. I am condemning Good to hear. And I am saying that it is exactly against the government policy. Okay, let's go back to our panel. Uh, Taslim Khalil, do you accept that this is about bringing the madrasas and bringing these groups forward, modernizing, getting jobs? What's your position on the re relationship between... Hefazat Islam came to prominence back in 2013 after the murder of a blogger, and their demand was capital punishment for anyone who would criticize Islam and atheists. They would carry placards saying that, you know, kill atheists like you would kill dogs and cats. That is Hefazat Islam. And now Sheikh Hasina has been declared as the mother of Komi uh, students in Bangladesh who have very questionable uh, ideas. I am not sure how Islamic uh, they are even. Saida Muna Taslim is here, the High Commissioner. What's your response when you hear, for example, it's not just atheist bloggers. There are many minorities in Bangladesh who are upset. The secretary of the Bangladesh Buddhist Federation said that when Hindus, Buddhists, and Christians face abuse in Bangladesh, there is no one to turn to for justice. That's quite damning, isn't it, from it's minorities in your country? It's actually quite baseless. I think Sheikh Hasina's party has been the most secular party that Bangladesh has ever witnessed. It's very clear that her policies in her previous government, she had five cabinet ministers who are Hindus and Christian and Buddhist. And in this cabinet, she has at least three cabinet ministers, full cabinet ministers, who are Hindus and Buddhist. After the Ramu incident, if you recall, Sheikh Hasina has rebuilt 19 Buddhist temples. Has Myanmar built one temple, one masjid? I mean, for most, if, if what Myanmar I'm is, is your that, benchmark for minority exactly, treatment, of course not. We're of in serious not. trouble. But when, it's not when, just Buddhists, though, is it? It's Buddhist leaders, Hindu leaders, Christian leaders. They're all saying, we feel I wouldn't under agree fire. with that. I wouldn't agree with that. Why does she empower women? She empowers women to marginalize extremist forces. And that is how Bangladesh is doing so well economically. Abbas Fais is here. What do you make of Gauhar Rizvi's argument that the government has tried its best and the High Commissioner's argument that has improved things in terms of protections for minorities, protections for atheist bloggers? Is that fair? Have there been massive improvements do you well, think in recent years? Protection from the minorities, no, the government hasn't done enough at all. Let Dr. Rizvi tell me how many people have been tried and convicted for setting fire on the homes of the Christians for attacking Hindu minorities okay. Good question. for... Yes, none have been brought to justice. Thanks. You have raised a very important issue. Minorities have often been uh, uh, victims of persecutions. But to say that under this government there has been persecution of minorities, please, I urge you to go back to your sources. I urge you to go back to... The most authoritative voice on this is... Uh, Hindu Buddhist Christian Association. They, are, they have told me that. Exactly I don't know that. what they have told you. Okay. They have come to the Prime Minister and they have thanked her. Never in the history of uh, Bangladesh, minorities have enjoyed as okay. much freedom. Just to as, be clear, what's as, the number yes. though? Just what's the number of convictions? Uh, that I don't know, but I can tell you one thing. When you are next visiting Dhaka, okay. I will be glad to tell you. All right. On that note, we're going to have to take a break. Do join us on Head to Head for part two with Gauhar Rizvi, where we're going to be talking about the Rohingya issue, and we're also going to hear from our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union after the break.
Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera English. My guest tonight is Gauhar Rizvi, International Affairs Advisor to the Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Uh, in recent years, Gauhar Rizvi, uh, one of the biggest challenges Bangladesh has had to face has not come from the inside but from the outside, uh, from neighbouring Myanmar. More than a million uh, Muslim Rohingya refugees have fled into Bangladesh. It's very admirable that your country has taken in uh, so many refugees. But here's what I don't get. Um, you've called what's happening in Myanmar ethnic cleansing. Your boss, the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, has called it, quote, tantamount to genocide and crimes against humanity. And yet your solution to the crisis seems to be to try and send the refugees back to Myanmar. It makes no sense, really. That is the end solution, that these people belong to Myanmar. They want to go back home, and they must go home. However, what we have also said is we will only send them when the, when the conditions are safe, and people will go back voluntarily. Very few governments in the world, let alone a developing society, host a million refugees and then say, we, we would like you to go back only when the situation is safe. Now, of course, the problem doesn't lie on Bangladesh side. It lies on Myanmar side. Agreed. And what else can Bangladesh do? The responsibility lies with the international community, that they must insist on making Myanmar safe for the return Agreed. of the Rohingya. In the meantime, though, you say we won't send them back while it's not safe, which is good to hear. And yet in November, there were reports covered by international media, covered by human rights groups, that you were trying to send them back against their will. Security forces were deployed uh, to some of the camps in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, refugees were told that if they didn't leave, they would stop receiving rations. They would be blocked from working with NGOs. The UN put out a statement saying, do not send them back against their will. That's what you were trying to do in November, though. No. Let me uh, clarify. What we had said was those who want to voluntarily return. Because Myanmar government criticized us, saying that Bangladesh is preventing the return, forcibly preventing the return of Rohingyas who want to come, come back. So we said, if those who would like to leave voluntarily may go. People refused to go voluntarily. We did not push out. We did not force. The UN referred to terror and panic in Cox's Bazaar, the imminent risk of being sent back against their will. I, I, I don't know from where uh, this statement came, but the UN, UNHCR right. person from Bangkok with whom I worked very, very, very uh, closely, we worked in, in concert. There was never, ever a question of any forcible repatriation. And you stuck, that is the policy of the Bangladesh government? That is government. the policy, and this is the policy the Prime Minister has announced again and again, including okay. at the United Nations. There's also a plan right now, I believe, from your government to send thousands of these refugees to a place called Basanchar, an island three hours from the mainland, which is particularly prone to cyclones and severe flooding. Uh, human rights groups have warned that it could become an island prison. Okay. The whole of coastal region is prone to cyclones, storms. Uh, tidal surges. So that island is not anything different from the rest of the coastal belt. Second thing is, on the one hand, we are under an enormous pressure from humanitarian organizations that there is congestion in these camps. These camps have become unsafe. Create more space for them so that they can live better. Mm. We have developed an island, put protections against surges. We have built uh, cyclone shelters there. But most important of all, we have said to these uh, international organizations, go and see it for yourself. And then uh, these people, if they voluntarily, some of them want to be relocated there, they are welcome to be. So the Guardian got footage of the island and what's being built there in November 2018. They found that families will be housed in rooms which measure two meters by two and a half meters, which have small barred windows. It does it, kind of sound prison-esque. Well, have you been? to the Cox's Bazaar camp? No. If you, if you had been to that camp, I can assure you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have uh, uh, quoted that. Because that accommodation created in Bashanchar is far, far superior to the current existence 
uh, of the temporary shelters in which they are living. OK, you could allow some other countries to take some of these refugees off your hands, but you don't seem to be letting them. The Bangladeshi government refused exit visas to Rohingya refugee women who had been offered asylum in Canada under a specific program designed to take care of victims of sexual violence. Why would you do that? When did this happen? In 2018. I don't know why this happened, but let me give you a larger explanation. The larger explanation is that there is a fear that if third country settlement begins to happen, and we don't know how many people Canada was willing to take. Yeah. There are a million people. If you want to take 50 or 60 people, all it does is it creates hope, those who are left behind in Myanmar, that if you can reach the camps of Bangladesh, you may be resettled in the third. That is the argument. You it's may not a good, it. It's not a good argument. You no, may it. reject You it. say the you people may. in Myanmar are facing genocide. If you're facing genocide, you want to get out. It doesn't get matter out. whether you go to Canada I, or not. Okay. I did not. I'm, I'm saying so. I said Fine. this is one another argument Fine. that has been. And what about the argument that you could have let more in earlier? It was admirable to let in a million people in the last couple of years. But Rohingya refugees have been fleeing the violence there for years now, as you well know, and yet you were turning them back. Between 2012 and 2016, yeah. Bangladeshi border guards were turning away refugees in the hundreds. Many of those people who turned away probably died. Go one step back. We already had three quarters of a million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. They have been there since the late, mid 1990s. So to say that we turned some back, which country has allowed so many people into their... And I said that's an admirable position. What I'm wondering is, given you've let these people in, given you said they're victims of genocide, in hindsight, at least, do you look back, go Rizvi, and say, you know what, yeah. I wish we'd let no, more we, in earlier. It, we no, could have saved no. more lives. See, these, they, what happens is when they came, the, your border guards, they are trained to prevent people from coming in. That was their reaction. When this came to the uh, high-level decision, I was present in the meeting that day. All the security forces argued that we should hold them back. Our prime minister said, no, this is a humanitarian crisis. Open the frontiers, let okay. them in. And I think this is the only unique example, possibly Angela Merkel yeah. was another, uh, where a million people nearly were allowed in okay. to the country. Fair but, enough. Let me ask you this, last question before we go to our panel and then the audience. Uh, you've said Myanmar should be referred to the International Criminal Court at the future stage. Do you think Aung San Suu Kyi, who I know you know personally, do you think she should face an international tribunal as well for her role in this genocide, or at least her role in denying and covering it up? Whoever is involved should be faced with the International Court of uh, Justice. There is no doubt because this was premeditated genocide. So you think there could be a case against Aung San Suu Kyi as well? It, could, it would be against the entire government or any member of government that aided and abetted in this process. Would you like to see her on trial? Uh, now, you are asking me to comment on a friend. Uh, and I, <laughs> I always have a soft spot for friends and I will hold back. Okay. Interesting choice of friends tonight. Um, <laughs> the, let's go to our panel of experts who are waiting here in the Oxford Union. Uh, I'm joined by Abbas Faiz, who's a South Asia analyst at UK's Essex University. He previously worked for Amnesty International for more than 30 years. Abbas, as a human rights activist and specialist, how worried are you about the fate of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh today? What's your view? It is commendable what Bangladesh has done, but that is not enough. They've got to actually start a very strong uh, movement within the international community to ensure that the pressure that n is needed to be placed on the government of Myanmar is done. The government of Bangladesh is not doing all of that. Saida Muna Tasneem is here, Bangladesh's High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. You've also served on Bangladesh's uh, National Task Force on the repatriation of uh, Rohingya refugees. Abbas says you've done well, but not enough. We have done excellent. We're the only country in the world who's giving maximum protection to the Rohingyas. Why isn't the world doing enough? That should be a question, not what Bangladesh is doing enough. Bangladesh is what a country which is an LDC. We are at least... 
Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the least developed country. We are we're the most densely populated country in the world. We are sharing our food and space and sovereign space with the Rohingyas. We've given, we've given 6,000 6, 6, acres of land for Rohingyas. We are protecting 60,000 women who are raped and gave babies, 70,000 babies who are rape babies. We're providing support and shelter to those babies. We're providing health, education, uh, you know, healthcare, prenatal, postnatal to women who are sexually violated in, uh, in Rakhine State. The question is, why isn't the world doing enough? Would, would, the, United King, would the United Kingdom be ready to take 1.1 million refugees? Would any other countries no. be ready to do that? It's a good question. I think we know the answer. Let me bring in Tasneem Khalil, who's a Swedish Bangladeshi journalist, author of Jallad, Death Squads and State Terror in South Asia. Tasneem, you're a critic of this government, but it's very difficult to disagree with what the High Commissioner is saying there. They've done a lot for the Rohingya refugees. This is Sheikh Hasina's finest hour. Man, the genocide is not something where we just you know, like have a competition of who has done enough and who has not, not done enough. I mean, I'd like to ask a direct question to uh, Dr. Rizvi here. I mean, you say that you want to see Myanmar tried at the International Court of Justice for genocide. You, on record, said it is a genocide. Prime Minister Sekhasina said it's a genocide. Now, what is stopping you from referring this case to the International Court of Justice under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention? I think the answer is obviously no, we haven't done it. But, you know, a government which has its hand full training, feeding, providing health care, to say why the government has Of course we will do. Of course we will okay, do. Okay, thank, we'll thank you. Thank you. We're going to wrap question. this up. And let's go to our audience. Raise your hands. I'm going to bring you in as, as, as many of you as I can. Let's go to the gentleman here in the front. I represent Ahmed bin Qasim. He was disappeared by the Bangladesh Special Forces RAB in August 2016, with all the evidence pointing to this being done on the direct orders of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. He's only one of hundreds who have been disappeared. These disappearances have been noted by UN human rights bodies, international human rights organisations, the international press okay. and foreign embassies. When will the Bangladesh government stop pushing the ridiculous line that the disappearances are not happening? And when will these men be released so they can return to their family? Okay. When di disappearances happen, it is, it is deplorable. And, but I have also said that this is not a government policy of uh, removing people. So where is his client? Uh, I wouldn't know. Since you are the lawyer, you tell us where is your client. You tell us. That's, go on, do you want to respond? And, and, and with, with proof. There was credible evidence he was being held in Dhaka cantonment, a military base in the middle of Dhaka. Uh, and that's credible evidence from foreign okay. embassies. Uh, and your government knows where he is. No one believes that you don't. No, you I, don't even okay, believe. That's fine. You well, don't even believe that. Move on. No, thank you for the statement. But you have said yeah, nothing. Yeah. You have just made a statement that he, he is You located. asked him a question. He told you where he thinks he is. No, he, now he, it's he, your he, job to go check it out. You're the I government. Check it He's out. not. I am prepared to check it out. But you know, when you use the word credible, well, I have to take your word for it. Well, uh, you want the cell number uh, as well? Some, some information. I mean, come on. He would give me some information. Let's go, to the, let's go back to the audience. Gentleman here in the front. Thank you. Uh, I covered the Rana, uh, Rana Plaza factory collapse and the aftermath of that. And Back in 2013. 2013, which was a convulsive event and which created a lot of promises from the government. I'm just curious because it seems that now, as thousands of workers are demanding fairer wages and have not been allowed to be unionized, they're being shot at, beaten up, and summarily uh, sacked from their jobs. This is a recent protest you're referring to. Uh, yes, and uh, despite uh, just two days after the election, the government gave a 75% tax break to factory owners, and in a country which has the highest growth rate amongst rich people in the world. Okay. I don't know if you have been back since you covered uh, Rana Plaza. Enormous changes have taken place. To begin with, Bangladesh is now fully compliant with its commitment to the ILO, ILO Convention. Bangladesh Constitution fully allows uh, unionization. There are no uh, uh, restrictions to it. Working with Accord and Alliance, we have improved and made all the factories safe. We are insisting that the owners provide a minimum health care in, in, uh, in the factories. 
And as far as the government is concerned, okay. there is no restriction whatsoever on unionization. So you what regret, has happened since... Do you regret that it took the deaths of hundreds of innocent people for these changes to come about on your watch? You know, tragically, often, a war, a tragedy, forces, uh, pushes the momentum and the speed at which changes take, okay. take place. So yes, in that sense, uh, it was, uh, it, it, a, a tragedy did uh, propel us to move fast. Okay, lady there, second round. What are the challenges and vision of present government in Bangladesh after this Lancet victory? Well, our uh, plans and uh, visions are very, very uh, straightforward. We have numerous steps. By 2021, we want to become a, a middle-income uh, state. By 2030, we want to complete and fulfill sustainable development goals to the extent po possible. And by 2042, we want to be a, a developed country. OK, let's go to the lady here in the front. Um, hi, you spoke about Shahidul Alam. I'm the niece of Shahidul Alam. Yes. We've sat here and heard you say that there's freedom of ex expression in Bangladesh. But you know what happened to my uncle, your friend, for scrutinizing the government, perhaps not in a dissimilar way from what's happening now as a journalist, the way that Mehdi is a journalist, also scrutinizing your government. We've all listened and laughed and debated about everything that's happening. But the reality is that Bangladesh is a living nightmare for thousands of people. You deny it, but there are torture there is torture, extrajudicial killings, disappearances, the ugliest face of the human condition. Okay. And if you're saying that everyone's lying, then I think you're insulting people. I'm asking you as a human being, how do you feel about this? Are you comfortable with this? I'm not asking as a politician. I'm asking you as a human okay. being. I, will, I would like to give you a direct answer. <laughs> I, I would really like to uh, give you a direct answer. I understand your pain. And I will also say, with uh, great respect to my friend, Shahid, that, and to compare him with what this journalist is doing, asking questions, is unfair. As I said earlier, he was not arrested, and I, I don't think one should be arrested, for uh, his journalistic work, but for spreading disinformation. The se well, well, second thing, second thing I want to say, you just said that life is uh, living hell in Bangladesh. Do you have any idea how the quality of life for millions of people have improved in the last 10 years? How millions of people have moved out of extreme poverty <laughs> and are leading? how Bangladesh has achieved higher social indices in all respect compared to oh, all its... You, Gaur Rizvi, all, none of all the, its neighbors. No one is disputing the economic record, but you, you social, are on record. Social, you are on record social, saying social, that development, development is not the same as democracy. You are the same, you are the one who said that. I said that these two go hand in hand. Exactly. And you cannot exclude. So I am coming to that. But you said it is living, living hell for thousands of people. I am telling you, their lives have improved. That is not to say that if there is a, a, a breach of uh, human rights, if there is uh, arbitrary uh, arrest of people, that we justify and we applaud. Absolutely not. And that is what I said. The Prime Minister's current agenda, high emphasis is on the question of governance. And when I say governance, it is a shorthand for all the things that we all of us aspire to. Uh, full liberty, freedom of expression, uh, you know, uh, imp uh, a real qualitative improvement but in But just life. on her particular question, to you personally, as someone who's not a politician yes. your whole life, the majority of your life you haven't been a politician. You're an academic, a scholar, you were teaching people about the world. When you read these reports from academics, from scholars, from human rights activists, all making the same claims about enforced disappearances, crackdowns on the press, torture, it doesn't bother you at all? Of course it bothers. But as I said, it is deplorable if these, are, where, where, uh, these things are true. And I also say to you, Whenever this information has come to me, and I, will not, I cannot at this moment divulge names, I have done everything personally, humanly possible to make sure, including in the case of your uncle, which I do not want to say it publicly. Okay, uh, let's go back to the audience. Yes, gentlemen here in the tight. Just a direct question to Mr. Rizvi. He is an advisor to the PM, 
and he's a very intellectual man. But does he call that when uh, there is a crackdown on opposition and there is an extrajudicial killing and enforced disappearances, even the opposition party doesn't have any freedom to gather a free assembly or anything, they cannot speak. Is that called democracy in Bangladesh? What has happened was not a crackdown. What happens is, again, this is the law of the land, that if you want to hold a public meeting, you need to secure the permission of the police department so that adequate uh, facilities are provided. But what, where the difficulty arose, when two parties decide on the same day to hold their meeting in the same venue. Now, which police force in the world will allow okay. two rival That's a very parties specific to assemble response. in the same Let's go back to the audience. Uh, Dr. Rizvi, you've, you've already answered a couple of questions on the enforced disappearances uh, and some of the other human rights violations, and you've used the term deplorable. Please. Why have you refused to engage with the UN special rapporteurs and working groups when they've tried to engage with you on this issue, and all you do is flatly deny the existence of these. That is true what he said. UN special rapporteurs are on record. I, I can, let me ask my colleague. We are working very closely with UN special rapporteurs. Geneva. But have you invited them to visit the country? They always request us to come to the country. We always allow that. And how I don't know they... of any record where we didn't allow and it. Are you going to take, the, the, take them to some of the prisons we heard mentioned earlier where some of these people might be Actually, held. UN Special Rapporteur has visited Bangladesh, visited Bangladesh's prison once. It's not a question of inviting them. There have been complaints, there have been requests made by the Special Rapporteurs that your government has not replied to and not engaged with in any way. OK, just before we finish, one last couple of questions from me very quickly. Um, you're an advisor to Sheikh Hasina. You've been for years. You represent her here on the international stage. You know that she is now widely considered by many people, many journalists, many governments, to be leading Bangladesh towards an authoritarian destination. You may not agree with that view, but you know that is the view of many people. Do you feed that view back to her? Does she care? Because there's a quote from her son where he says that she thinks it's a badge of honor to be called authoritarian. Well, <laughs> no, what he was saying is, uh, Lee Kuan Yew has been called an authoritarian person. Uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, okay. uh, uh, Mahathir Mohammed, has been called. So he was putting okay. it in that uh, context. My point is this. Yes, these things have been said. We have heard it. We have heard it, and we, we hear it again and again. I think the reality is very different. We have had regular elections, not only at the no, national... No, no, you made this point. Yeah. I'm asking about her. What is her attitude when you tell her? This is what people say to me. You travel she, around the she, world, she knows and people raise she, these complaints. She, she what reads, do you say to her? She reads newspapers. Yeah. She reads, uh, uh, gets her... Does daily, it bother her? Da a ...daily briefing. And she knows that this is not what she is. And does it bother you? You're an academic, a scholar. You, people have a lot of time for you. You've taught at Harvard, Oxford, before you joined this government. Do you ever think, you know what, this is hard work going around defending Sheikh Hasina. Time to head back to academia. <laughs> I can tell you one thing. I, while I would love to do uh, uh, that, let me say to you, I am truly delighted to be able to stand and speak for a person who has qualitatively change the lives of millions of people in Bangladesh. That is, okay. and, and as she has promised herself, that she is going to address many of the questions that have been raised. So I think we should applaud her for what she has achieved. We should give her the credit where the okay. credit is due, and to start believing that somewhere in the middle, because some people say she's very good, some people say she's very bad, okay. so we t uh, take the middle. No, let's be a little bit more. But uh, you have no plans to retire anytime soon. I'm Ooh. 70. I'm 70 this year. Well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, I have uh, 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 writing aspirations, but at the same time, I'm very privileged and okay. honored to serve Sheikh Hasina. Gahar Rizvi, thank you very much for joining me on Head to Head. That's our show. Head to Head will be back next week. Thank you. Thank you.